welcome to the Gospel Online. We're going to have a look today in this video as to whether we've got the right Gospels. Are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels of the New Testament, the right ones? Or should some of the alternatives that have been discovered be included in the New Testament alongside Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? Do they have something to tell us about the life, teaching and actions of the Lord Jesus Christ? Should we be reading them alongside each other? Or are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John the right ones? So when we say the right Gospels, are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John actually the ones that most accurately of all the records that there are, of all the Gospels suggested, the correct ones to teach us about Jesus, his life and his teachings? Or should we give the alternatives a chance? And that's what we're going to have a look at in this video. We're going to have a look at the, the difference between the two. A bit of background first. There are loads and loads of uh, documents which have been found, some of which have got the word gospel attached to them. These documents potentially give us a fresh look at Christianity and Jesus Christ himself. And it's suggested by New Testament scholars that the gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were just four of many alternatives and that there was a concerted effort to push these alternatives out. It's even been taken up by fiction writers and Hollywood films to suggest that actually the Gospels themselves were the choice of one man. In the book The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, one of the characters, Sophie, talking to an academic called Teabing, says this, who chose the Gospels to include, Sophie asked. Aha, Teabing burst in with enthusiasm. The fundamental irony of Christianity, the Bible as we know it today, was collated by the pagan Roman emperor, Constantine the Great. So this is fantastic stuff. This is a conspiracy of the highest order, suggesting that actually there were other Gospels which could have been included, but the Roman Emperor Constantine himself selected these four. This sensationalism aside, it's a valid question. Should we be thinking about reading these alternatives and how do they stack up against the perhaps more familiar Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? So what are the alternatives to the four? Well, there are 16 of the many documents uh, that have been discovered, which are given in some shape or form the title gospel. The word gospel just means good news. And it's come to mean a record, perhaps, of the life of Jesus or something that impacts on our understanding of Jesus. So these are the alternatives that we're going to look at. There are many other documents that perhaps impact on our understanding of early Christianity and its history, but these are the ones that we're going to be concentrating on and comparing with the four. But how are we going to compare them? Let's look at three things. The first is dating. The second is the authority and authenticity of these documents. And thirdly, the style and emphasis and the differences. So those are the three things that we're going to have a look at. Let's look at dating first then. What about the alternatives? Well, it's interesting to note that the alternatives of that 16, nine of them only are in the second century. The others are late second century or even later. By comparison, the four Gospels themselves, by scholarly consensus, are all first century documents. Uh, they range from 70 AD for Matthew up to 100 AD for John. Uh, and there are some scholars that would suggest that they're even earlier, that most of the Gospels were around before AD 70. The point of this is that there is a difference, substantial difference between the two. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John essentially are eyewitness accounts or records of eyewitness accounts. Uh, Matthew and John being disciples of Jesus himself. Whereas the alternatives are much, much later efforts by people thinking about what was going on in Christian terms. Uh, it's even suggested that the top four on the rock of that, uh, on, of those column, um, are actually different versions of Matthew or Luke. So there's potentially a 70 to 100 year difference between these gospels, the one being eyewitness accounts and the others being secondary attempts to record something of Jesus maybe 50 or 100 years later than the other Gospels. Well, what about the authority of the four? By the time we get to the late second century, we get lots of writings by the early Christian fathers. And one of those was one of the bishops, a bishop of uh, Lyon in 
southern France, in Gaul as it was then, Irenaeus, who writing in around AD 180, uh, talks about the Gospels, and it's only four of them that he includes in his list, and they are the commonly known ones, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, uh, and he discusses the Gospels. He refers to others, but he considers only these four to be authoritative and the ones that he would refer to himself. There's the Muratorian fragment, which is found in Italy. So we move across Europe now. Uh, and this, by internal evidence, is dated around uh, AD 170. And it's a, a partial list of books that were considered authoritative in around 170 AD. It's, it's only 85 lines long uh, and it uh, ends abruptly and it, it's cut off at the beginning, but it starts with a list of New Testament documents discussing, again, the emphasis on being eyewitness, um, at which nevertheless he was present. And so he placed them in his narrative, talking about the second gospel, which isn't named, but the third one is, and so is the fourth. The third book of the gospel is that according to Luke. The fourth of the Gospels is that of John, one of the disciples. So this very early list of books which are accepted as being authoritative to tell us about Jesus Christ and his teaching and the teaching that comes after includes Luke and John. Uh, and the other two uh, we are presuming in this list would have been Matthew and Mark. Well, let's think further afield. Clement of Alexandria, a lot of the discoveries of documents uh, have been in the Middle East, um, particularly at the Nag Hammadi uh, Library that was discovered in Upper Egypt. Uh, and Egypt seems to be a source of many of these documents uh, due to the climate. It's nice and dry and papyri uh, last and have survived. But Clement of Alexandria, one of the early fathers, at the end of the second century into the early third century, did a lot of writing and he quoted from all sorts of different documents in the things that he said. It's just interesting to note how the different proportions of the Gospels uh, are quoted. You would expect if the alternatives were as valid as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you would expect uh, somebody like Clement of Alexandria to quote even handedly across all of these Gospels. And yet when we analyse the figures, Clement of Alexandria actually quotes from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John substantially more than any other Gospel. So the alternative Gospels don't feature, other than in discussion perhaps, of uh, their existence. He, he quotes, for example, from Matthew over 700 times. Um, and in total, the four Gospels are quoted 1600 times by Clement. When we compare this with the alternatives, the Gospel of the Egyptians and the Gospel of the Hebrews are quoted only three times each. Um, if we add in Thomas, Peter, Edgerton Gospel, Judas and Mary, he never quotes them. So the contrast is very, very stark. Uh, and it's clear from somebody like Clement of Alexandria that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were given much more importance in the things that they had to say uh, and the number of quotations that are made by by early fathers of these four books that we have in our New Testament. The alternatives just don't stack up and are not quoted at all by some uh, other early fathers. So that's authority. What about the authenticity of them? Now this is a huge subject in itself and um, there's a link that I'll show you at the end which you can share um, and, and that you can look at. But let's just run through a number of things that make the four Gospels stand out from the alternatives, which don't have these things that we're going to look at. Archaeology is uh, a massive subject in itself, but the archaeology of the Middle East lends support to some of the small details of the, the four Gospels. It talks about people, places and things. Uh, and the archaeology of the, the Middle East supports all of the small details, whether it's people like Herod, uh, people like Pontius Pilate, who are part of the crucifixion narrative, whether it's Capernaum, where Jesus made his home, or Jerusalem, where he spent much of his time, or, or whether it's simple day to day things in society, um, like a fishing boat in, in Galilee. Archaeology supports some of the small details that there are in the four Gospels. It just isn't the case with the alternatives, which are very much different, and we'll come on to having a look at their style and what they contain. 
Another interesting feature of the four, which again doesn't occur in the much later second century alternatives, are what are called linguistic fossils, uh, hangovers from early documents which are then translated into Greek. So the New Testament written in Greek, the Gospels written in Greek, um, have hangovers from what would have been the, the natural language of maybe the disciples and Jesus himself. Single words or a couple of words like Abba meaning father and Talitha kumai meaning arise little maid or entire sentences Jesus quotes on the cross Eli Eli lama sabachthani. There are also uh, linguistic hangovers plays on words and puns strain it a gnat a gamla swallow a camel a camla it, 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 it just isn't there in the Greek and it doesn't translate but actually these things that are left for us in the four just aren't there and again this is just a, a real uh, a tour through uh, some of these ideas and there are lots of others there are undesigned coincidences uh, and again we'll show you the the link um, at the end that you can look at these things in more detail well what about the style of the the, the four and the alternatives uh, the four are very much based around narrative what jesus does who he meets and the things that he teaches. By contrast, by and large, the alternative gospels that we've got are dialogues between Jesus pre pre predominantly and individuals, uh, which discuss sometimes quite philosophical uh, ideas and, and, and quite strange happenings between Jesus and, and his, uh, the people he's talking to. The Gospel of Thomas is unique in the terms of the fact that it has no narrative. It is simply sayings, parables and, and teachings. But there are others that are pious reflections on uh, Jesus and Christianity and a disciple's life with no particular structure whatsoever. So the style is very, very different. Uh, and again, I'll show you, share a link with you that you can go and read the alternatives yourselves and you will see the stark contrast that there is between the two. The clear narrative and teaching of the four is contrasted by the sometimes quite strange and esoteric uh, difference that there is with the alternatives. Well what's the emphasis of the four gospels? Well Jesus's message was a clear one of repentance, changing your ways and the coming kingdom of God. He said he was fulfilling the law and the prophets and the things that had been spoken about in the Old Testament were now starting to come true. And he was fulfilling some of the promises that had been made. This from the Gospel of Mark. The time is fulfilled. These are words of Jesus and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Re relieve the good news that I'm, I'm teaching and talking to you about and demonstrating in power by the things that I am doing. And the four, by and large, are consistent in their message of repentance and the kingdom of God. Well, what about the alternatives? Well, the emphasis of the alternatives is largely on secret knowledge. And remember, these are documents that are written anywhere between 75 and 100, and sometimes more later than the original gospels, and sometimes 150 years plus later than the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, had been around for quite some time by the time these new documents are coming along. And yet these new documents purport to have things that have been hidden, that are new uh, and that should be known. Just a quick uh, run through of just three. These are the hidden sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Judas Thomas, the twin, wrote. This is the secret message of judgment. Jesus spoke with Judas Iscariot from the Gospel of Judas. Mary answered and said, what is hidden from you, I shall reveal to you. So the emphasis of the alternative is things that are hitherto unknown, even though it's a hundred years later. And they are expecting us to accept that these things have equal weight to the very clear message of repentance and the kingdom of God given to us by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So the style of the alternatives is very different and the emphasis of them is very different. And that's understandable. They are written at a different time, in a different era, where the knowledge of Jesus has been around for at least 100, 100 plus years. And people have been speculating about what it means to them. And that's what we find with these alternative gospels, that they are 
thinking about what Jesus has said, what is known already, and some of them reflect on uh, passages from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and sometimes even quote them verbatim. So, do they have any value? Are they historically interesting? Well, yes, absolutely. They tell us an enormous amount, the alternatives, to the second century development of Christianity, how people's thinking was going, particularly in the areas where these documents are found. Are they historically valuable? Absolutely. They tell us an awful, an awful amount about uh, what was going on in the second century. Are they, though, reliable witnesses to Jesus? Do they tell us something that we don't know from the four? Well, I'll, I will say to that, no, they're not reliable witnesses to Jesus. This is speculation hundreds of years later, uh, based on uh, people ruminating about philosophical ideas which are starting to come into the second century church. Do we value the four? Are they historically interesting? Yes. Do they provide us with the best record of the life, actions and teachings of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Are they reliable witnesses to Jesus? Yes, again, these are eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did, what he taught and what he wanted his disciples to take away from his life and to understand about his message of hope, of a kingdom to come, of which he would be king. So that's a really quick whiz through dating, the authenticity and the acceptance of the four and the difference between the style and emphasis of the four Gospels that we have in our New Testament and the alternatives. As I say, this has just been an introduction with perhaps some signposts for you to look out for as you do your own reading. And here's some suggested further reading for you. Uh, there's a great book called Who Chose the Gospels? Um, there's a great website talking about gospel authenticity, which deals in greater detail with the archaeology, uh, with undesigned coincidences and more details about linguistic fossils called BibleThink.org. And if you're interested in reading the alternative gospels for yourself to see the difference that there is between them and the four gospels of the New Testament, visit Gospels.net, which gives uh, free access to translations of the alternative gospels and even gives you the opportunity to look at some of the original documents as well. So thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have, please comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to the Gospel Online and look out for other videos that will come your way shortly. Thanks for listening.